Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How Cities Are Responding to the Pandemic, brought to you by Tamarack's Vibrant Communities Cities Reducing Poverty Network, a network of 80 plus cities and communities leading local collaboratives that are aimed at reducing poverty locally. My name is Christine Hadigal, Manager of Cities at Tamarack, and I'm delighted to introduce you to today's moderator of our discussion, Mary Rowe, President and CEO of Canadian Urban Institute. Mary has a really incredible background. She's worked all throughout Canada and the States over the last 30 years and has been a steady advocate and champion for place-based approaches to building livable and resilient cities. Welcome, Mary. Thanks, everybody. I'm pleased to be here and uh, pleased to have another opportunity to really learn. I think that COVID's providing us with extraordinary opportunities to try to understand what's going on on the ground and uh, what, what the um, challenges of COVID are exposing for us about things that weren't working before and the things that need to get fixed as we emerge. We've been describing it to the Canadian Urban Institute that COVID's like a particle accelerator. Every aspect of urban life that was challenged before COVID is now just completely blown apart. We have to try to really figure our way through these things. So I'm really, really pleased to be joining Augustina and Kirsten and Alicia and you, um, Christine, for trying to understand how we're navigating this. And also, as we learn from each other, Canada doesn't do vertical, it do, does do vertical learning quite well, municipalities to provinces to the federal government, but we don't do horizontal learning well, very well, which is why Tamarack and all the work that it's been doing um, through the Vibrant Communities Initiative and all its various platforms to try to create better connected tissue, better learning, so that we can adapt faster, learn quicker, and learn from each other's mistakes and learn from the things that are going well. So I'm very, very pleased to be with you this morning or this afternoon, depending on which time zone you're tuning in from, uh, and to get a chance to uh, benefit from all your rich experience on the ground. So thanks for having me, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and hearing what you have to say. Christine, you're gonna start us, I gather. We're giving us a bit of an overview on, um, on what you can see as being the, the uh, immediate impact. So we'll look forward to that. And then we'll, after we're done, then we'll start hearing from the others. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. And uh, I apologize, I don't have my video on. It's not working. Zoom has its challenges uh, during this time. And um, this is one of them. So I'm not trying to be impersonal, but glad to be with you all with audio. Um, so I just want to give a very high level summary of a report that we published in early May um, on how cities are responding to COVID. Um, and so what we did was we looked at our 81 members um, that represent over 320 communities across Canada and the US to see how they were responding. And from those responses, we pulled 60 stories of innovation and resilience to really provide a, a point in time snapshot. You know, this was one point in time in April when we did this report, um, but I do think that it has um, some lessons um, and some examples that would be useful to communities across the country um, as they continue to respond, as they move into recovery, and as they plan for a second wave. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight some of those uh, responses. So we really found sort of four buckets. The first was around coordinating service delivery and information sharing. So everything from ex new ways of expanding food access, having to pivot now towards delivery, new delivery models and distribution models and really expand the amount of food that's being delivered um, and the scale and the scope of that. Um, finding housing and, sh and safe shelter for vulnerable populations. So looking at, for example, cities that have procured hotels and community centers to convert those public and private spaces into places for shelter. Um, we looked at innovative um, supports for local businesses and nonprofits. So um, all the myriad ways that cities have provided um, supports to local businesses during this time. Um, we found examples of uh, many different uh, approaches to free transportation, you know, from completely eliminating bus fares to other approaches to, to ensure that people were still able to get the resources they need during this time. Um, we found examples of financial empowerment programs that went digital, you know, uh, tax clinics that went online and other forms of um, income support programs that were developed in response to COVID. And then, of course, uh, the mental health services that expanded during this time and adaptation of education and education programs. So all of those examples are highlighted in this report. We, we really encourage you to check it out on our website. Um, the second bucket was really around supporting vulnerable populations that were in isolation. So we found lots of examples of wellness checks for seniors, um, 
examples of communities that um, expanded internet service and technology, you know, through distributing laptops and phones, setting up school buses with internet signals, all sorts of creative ways to expand the access to technology. Um, and then uh, lots of self-organized groups that were responding to provide those um, check check-ins for isolated individuals. The third bucket was around mobilizing funds for local response efforts. So um, Kathy's going to be speaking about the Atlantic Compassionate Fund, and that's one example of um, local efforts for fundraising. But there were lots of others that we found as well that were really important to bolster um, the initiatives um, that I previously mentioned around food assistance. And finally, uh, advocacy campaigns. So, a lot of a lot of communities are looking at this opportunity to advocate to higher levels of government for policy change in areas such as um, universal basic income, paid sick days, increases to social assistance, um, and regulation for payday lending. So that's just a few of the examples that we found, and we really um, see this really as a time um, to uh, sectoral partnerships, um, and that's why we're so excited to have this conversation today um, because the four speakers that we have on our call today are really um, exa shining examples of that cross-sectoral collaboration and um, driving community innovation. So um, thanks again for giving me a chance to highlight this uh, report. We really encourage you all to, to check it out. Back to you, Mary. It'd be great if we could uh, get the link to that report posted in the chat. Maybe uh, Rute could do that uh, so that other people can see it and refer to it later. And I'm assuming that the chat will be available for people to see after the fact, uh, which is terrific, so that people can refer to it again. Um, and I'm sure that there may be comments that the uh, other presenters may want to raise it with you, Christine, so you're not gone forever. We'll have you back when, when it's uh, the right time. Let's, let's now go to uh, the District of Mission and hear from uh, Kirsten Hargraves, who's the Social Development Manager for the District of Mission. She's going to talk to us about, first of all, she tells us it's a kind of a cloudy and rainy in, in BC, what a surprise. Just saying, uh, but, uh, uh, but we're interested to hear uh, about your work, uh, Kirsten, particularly as it's been uh, you know, hyper-focused during COVID. So over to you. Absolutely, thank you. Good, good morning, everyone across Canada <laughs> this morning, joining us on the call. <laughs> Mission British Columbia, if, if you're unfamiliar with our, our, little, our little community, that red dot on the map, we're a, we, we consider ourselves a small to medium-sized community, so about 40, just over 40,000 people for us is small to medium. I know that's different depending on where you're joining us from today. And Mission's about 80 kilometers southeast of Vancouver, so just to orient us geography-wise. Um, and I sit this morning on the unceded ancestral territory of the Stalo people. We actually have five First Nations bands that intersect with Mission British Columbia. And this morning, I sit upon and come to you from Stalo territory. So our initial uh, COVID response steps, the municipality as a whole developed a COVID-19 task force for the municipality or our EOC. And as part of that, we wanted to look at the social response and the social sector. So we created what we called a Vulnerable Persons Action Team or VPAT. And some of my training this last year has really been in crisis response and emergency management. And that language very much comes from that bucket. So that's where that, that name comes from. And we're looking at everybody that we could consider vulnerable or multiple barriered in some way, but specifically from our working groups that work with our vulnerable segment, we had identified seniors, especially shut-in seniors and elders. Uh, all of our unsheltered individuals sleeping outdoors as well as unstably housed indoors and our low-income families were really the first three pockets that concern was raised about. So the purpose of the VPAT really was to act as a hub where we could have a representative from every sector that intersects with these vulnerable groups to make sure that food, housing, basic needs could be met throughout COVID. And part of that was looking at our food supply chain, um, certainly for all of community. And you'll see on that on this slide, it, it has all of community as tier one and vulnerable groups as tier two. Vulnerable group, groups absolutely are part of all community, but we do recognize that they have some unique needs and unique distinctions that we wanted to make sure that we were meeting. And that's why we have that divide there. So some of our goals <clears throat> around the multiple barriered folks 
um, were definitely to identify shelter. And so one of the very first actions we did was go into some of our more primary camps of unhoused individuals and ask, how can we assist you when it comes to drop spots for food, drop spots for different items? We didn't want to be making those decisions. So we went into the camps and asked, where do you frequent the most? Where would the best spot be for this? Because we really didn't know, as none of us knew, how serious COVID was going to get. And so we wanted to have spots that throughout COVID, if um, individuals were no longer able to access indoor spaces, which is exactly what happened with our nonprofits and social service agencies needing to close doors, that we could still be delivering food, feminine hygiene products, essential items to people. So with our unhoused community, we identified five core drop spots where at least once a week, usually twice a week, we are continuing to deliver food and items and hand washing supply stations. We talked a lot about porta potties and how do we how do we assist people in maintaining their own hygiene. In the very beginning of COVID, we heard that people were starting to double up and triple up in tents. So it's the opposite of what many of us expected, but um, isolation really brings fear and the desire to come together around the unknown. And so we were really seeing this kind of duplicating and triplicating in areas that we kept hearing from our health authority and the province to, you know, minimize our contact with people. So we really increased our conversations with the unhoused community around, around that and how do we work with you, recognizing that there's a need to be together, there's a need to address isolation and also keep people safe. So the main way we did that was um, to really be able to assist with more tents and shelter where necessary, as well as um, delivering without hand sanitizer, delivering soap and water and encouraging hand washing stations where we could. We also did end up, our community opened up some extra beds to assist people in relocating from the street and camp community if, if they wanted to do so. And if they did not want to do so, then the municipality and community worked with them to stay put where they are and as safe as they could be. Part of the VPAC goals, as we populate these slides, <laughs> was also to assess nonprofit preparedness. So where are the gaps with staffing? We recognize that uh, some staff right away in early stages of COVID decided this was work that was too much for them and they moved on. And it's a difficult time to hire new staff when we're in the unknown. So part of our, our assessment process was looking at what staff are you needing? And as you can imagine, and I'm sure as many of you have experienced that, that was changing weekly, sometimes daily. So we looked at, could we, could we redeploy people in a sense across agencies? Uh, we even looked at, could we, could we maybe send some individuals from the municipality to assist at these nonprofits, thereby increasing some of their awareness and education to some um, social challenges that maybe hadn't been part of their regular job. And so we looked at all the benefits and all the challenges that something like that could bring. And we did have some cross pollination between agencies of trying to help out where we could. That also included volunteerism. We had individuals assisting places like the food bank, picking up food. Um, I know there's an individual on the call today that's really been a big help to me. And part of her role was to be redeployed in going all over the lower mainland to pick up extra stock at warehouses and manufacturers where we could find it and fill up food centers and food banks with different needs. So it was really looking at everything from redeploying our, our human capacity and human resources all the way down to different supplies and stock. Now we're on the other end of that. So now we're really looking at the operational reopening and the sustainability of those organizations. And there's been quite a bit of change and movement for some of those agencies as they think about reopening their doors. So that was, I think, a real positive in mission in our ability to not just stay informed, but be able to help each other out through the sharing of resources and capacity. And some of those other bullet points, things like cell numbers, again, we didn't know where the situation was going to send us. So really making sure we could have communication with each other in ways that weren't, weren't traditional. We didn't, we didn't know how much we'd be seeing or talking to each other. The emergency food security plan really was three core areas to look at. Communication as the first, availability as the second, and distribution as the, as the third. So communication, I went and met with the managers of our core grocery stores, explained who I was, what my role was, what the VPAT, the Vulnerable Persons Action Team role was in community, and really asked them, invited them to partner with us in this. 
We recognize that they are also facing a lot of unknowns and a lot of stress. My ask to them through letters coming at different times, initially in letter one, please reduce the ability for people to buy in lump sums of items, creating hours for seniors and elders, those that are immune compromised. So we had some of that in place in mission before the province encouraged grocery stores to do that. So really trying to get ahead of these needs that we could see coming up. Our second letter asked for early appraisal. Please keep us in the loop. Keep us informed of any interruptions that they might be receiving to their, their truck supplies, their food supply chains, both from in Canada and across the border. And so it was a new ask for grocery stores and it did take some really intentional communication to help them understand why, you know, who, who we are, why that's important to community. And part of that also then was helping communicate to community what the needs are around donations. The second part of that, availability in the short term. So uh, we've talked about documenting the needs for supplies and resources, weekly check-ins, sometimes daily check-ins with all the different programs that are accessing and, and servicing food for seniors and families. We've talked about identifying the drop spots um, as, as well as the long-term plan which then starts to look at if we were to land in a very serious community-wide food insecurity situation, how do we then obtain food? How do we connect with our local farmers? Where do we store that food? So we went to our school district and identified a school that had a big industrial kitchen, did a bit of an environmental scan of what industrial kitchens exist in this community across schools and across agencies. Where could we store a really large amount of food if we needed to? And how would we distribute that to 40,000 people if we landed in worst case scenario around food security? So we really quickly started to action these three tiers of the plan. Again, really not knowing where it was going to land us, but wanting to get as much ahead as we could. And some of these in this slide, the extra food needs around culturally sensitive food, um, different diseases. So certainly individuals with diabetes often require extra protein. All the special food needs for infants and bedridden, seniors and elders, tube feeding, allergies, celiac, gluten-free, sick diets. Uh, when we really started to, to uncover all the different needs we had to address, um, it, it was quite a lot to, be, to get prepared for. Where do we access this? Our commercial kitchen inventory I mentioned, and part of that was also connecting with all our restaurants as they were closing their doors and asking, what are you doing with the food remaining in your kitchen? Can you donate it to community? Can we purchase it from you for the sectors that are in need? Uh, and we received quite positive feedback to that. And then again, identifying local stock. So it's really doing the math. <laughs> How much would it take of each item to feed 40,000 people? And then all of the extra uh, uniquenesses that come along with trying to feed a broad community. The third tier was distribution and I've talked a little bit about that. So the storage, the distribution, um, things like Starfish Backpacks is a program we have for families, often families without vehicles. So it's, it's quite literally filling and delivering a backpack of food every week and we are continuing to do that to uh, over 80 families in need and mission. And even connecting with local chefs in mission, those that have the expertise to prepare food in a, in a healthy and safe way and starting to ask about that, would you be interested if we landed in a really serious scenario to assist us with that and what would that look like? Um, and looking at bulk buying programs. Christine, we haven't might, done- Christine, you might just hustle it up a little bit because we've got, we got three other presentations behind you. So keep going. Right. Yeah, Thank you. talk a little faster. <laughs> All right, we're, mo we're moving through food. Moving on. <laughs> that gives us an idea about that. Uh, community mobilization. So my role is really uh, a dot connector as a, a liaison between the municipality and our community services. And one of the things that became apparent right away was that we are all dealing with critical incidents every day. So it's, it's no longer just the frontline service providers. We, I represent a diverse team of RCMP, mental health workers, nonprofits, and all of us are trying to work together to respond to this when communication starting to be affected by the lack of face-to-face -face time together. So that number two there, um, periods of increased stress, absolutely. Our, all of our <laughs> stress responses um, have been very heightened over COVID and that as, as our stress responses get heightened, conflict starts to work its way in there. So we are experiencing more conflict in our community and we have had to get creative with how to address that uh, when we can't see each other face to face. I, I often say Zoom calls are, are, are like texting. You're not often getting the 
the full picture from people and you're certainly not able to support each other face to face. So some of these points here, um, we've done a lot of work around trauma and resiliency informed practice and mission. We need to recognize and acknowledge these tensions are very real for all of us. Even the Downtown Business Association, anyone representing a business where their income has been paused or put on hold starts to create new, new tensions and conversations between the social service sector and the business community. So we're really acknowledging that and getting very intentional about how to address that going forward. We do plan to hold workshops in the fall around four concrete areas, mental health and addiction, food security, social supports, access to healthcare. Our purpose will now look a little bit different since coming through COVID. Whoop, these, these slides are hopping forward. Oh well. <laughs> so those four points at the bottom, the intentionality as I mentioned, how do we now create positive face-to-face -face experiences for each other. We've had isolation from each other as those that work in community, not just those that we're, we are considering unhoused or haven't been able to access inside supports. There will be a debriefing component, including celebrating what we've done well. This, this has been a lot of hard <laughs> for a lot of people. What have we done well? What can we do better next time? Utilizing actions. And then of course, there's, there's a relaying to community all the good that's been done too. And we are finishing today with dogs. So mission, for whatever reason, our team happens to be a very, a very dog-loving team. These are my two, Nalu and Kona. And uh, Dr. Colleen Dell works with the Canadian Centre for Addictions and uh, Mental Health. And she's also a faculty member at University of Saskatchewan. We know from the literature on companion animals how much animals, canines especially, help us reduce our stress response. So as we see our stress response rising in community, we are bringing in things like therapy dogs and really asking people what will assist you as we move forward in mission. Dogs, dogs seem to help with that. So I thought we'd end, with, we'd end with a hopeful slide with these little canines here. And it really is about generating hope moving forward. Hope through dialogue, positive social engagement. It's been a, it's been a heck of a lot of work, but uh, I'm pretty proud of our little community. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. Terrific. Terrific examples, and as, we're, I, as we come around the corner on this, I hope we're going to start to talk about all the lessons that we've learned in the emergency situation. How much of this can we actually make stick? Can it actually be sustainable, uh, if it should be? Um, uh, there's a request on the chat that all the slides be made available, and I'm pretty sure the voice of God at the beginning said that all slides would be available, so we're looking forward to that so people can get more detail. If you don't see it up on the screen long enough, you'll have a chance subsequently to look at that stuff. So now we've got the dynamic duo coming from Peel, uh, Alicia and Augustina. And um, if people are looking at their stats, we at CUI have something called citywatchcanada.ca, which puts up every day 62 city, cities across the country, 62 of them, what they're challenged by through COVID. And uh, many of you will know that Peel has had a particular challenge. It continues to have significant challenges with COVID. So um, we're very keen to hear about the initiatives that you guys have been laying down and the work that I know that this work predates and your collaborations predate, um, thank goodness, predate COVID because I'm sure that stood you in good stead uh, as you've been trying to actually be responsive in a multi-stakeholder way. So over to you two to fill us in on um, what you've been learning in Peel. Thank you, Mary, um, and welcome everyone. So yes, as Mary did mention, uh, Peel has been particularly hard hit uh, with COVID, and uh, thankfully we're uh, now on the cusp of heading into stage two, a bit behind a lot of the other uh, cities in Ontario. Um, as of Wednesday, we finally got the go-ahead to move to our stage two as we've seen our numbers start to drop. And so, you know, we have had um, a lot of uh, a lot of positives come out of this. Um, and one of the big things is really sort of uh, the level of collaboration uh, with our community partners that we have managed to um, engage during this during this time. So uh, my name is Alicia. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Augustina, from the region of Peel. And we're really excited to share with you some of the learnings that we that have emerged through the pandemic um, with the the uh, establishment of uh, Peel Region's COVID-19 Community Response Table, otherwise known as the CRT, and the intersections with our 10-year Peel Poverty Reduction Strategy. If I can advance this here, perfect. So, um, oops, perfect. 
So uh, the community response table really emerged during the early days of the pandemic when the re when regional staff have surveyed approximately 190 organizations to really understand how Peel community agencies were immediately impacted by COVID-19 and to also inform our emerging funding needs of the sector. A lot of our agencies were really on the verge of closing their doors and of course that would have left a massive gap in terms of um, services and supports available for our vulnerable uh, populations. 131 agencies responded to that survey um, across multiple sectors such as food security, housing and homelessness, employment, children, uh, things like that. Uh, survey uh, participants really shared many of the challenges that they were experiencing really at the onset of the pandemic. And one of the questions that we had asked is what are the impacts? And at, at that time, because it was such early stages, many of them just didn't even know. They weren't even able to articulate what the vast impacts would be. They just knew um, sort of what that immediate onset was and the need to shift their um, service delivery models, things like that. So one of the things that we did hear from them was they really um, wanted to join with others virtually to really address those community needs. So what we did is we leveraged a lot of our existing relationships with our community partners, many of which are members of our Peel Poverty Reduction Committee, and established this community response table, um, which is basically facilitated by a working group of regional staff and two project managers. The first meeting of that community response table consisted of a really small group of agencies, but it rapidly grew to what is now a large virtual table of roughly about 70 to 90 attendees on each call um, from those community organizations and agencies across Peel, um, as well as representation from several of our anchor institutions, such as um, the Peel, uh, the district school boards, um, as well as William Oslo Health Center, as well, um, we also have representation from our municipal partners from Brampton, Caledon, and Mississauga, which are the three municipalities that make up Peel region. The main purpose of the CRT is really to help local agencies to support our vulnerable and at-risk populations in identifying and responding to those emergent needs from uh, the pandemic. And we do this by really supporting that coordination, information sharing, uh, group problem solving, and collaboration between all members of the table of the CRT. We've really done a really good job of kind of gathering all the information, especially at the onset of the pandemic when we had lots of information coming in, lots of things coming in from the federal government, from the provincial government. There were so many, so the community agencies with, were bombarded with information and they just didn't even know how to make sense of it. It was just a lot. So one key piece of all of our, our meetings is really to just kind of provide those high level updates from the federal level, um, the provincial level, as well as the regional level, so that they had one, uh, it was sort of a one-stop shop for them to have all of the most recent information. Uh, the first meeting uh, took place on the 23rd of March, and we've had about 30 meetings to date. So um, with those 30 meetings, basically for the first two months, we were holding those meetings roughly about three times a week. And then once we moved out of that emergency response phase of the pandemic, um, we've conducted check regular check-ins with our CRT members to really ensure that the frequency of the meetings were still meeting their needs. So recently we transitioned to twice per week and we're now going to be further reducing it to once per week for the month of July and August. But of course, um, we have another check-in built in because the CRT was really designed to be as flexible and responsive as it needed to be. So we are able to sort of ramp up and ramp down as required. Um, so this is, we really felt that this was an important piece because of course we didn't really know what this pandemic was gonna look like in the event that we have a second wave. How do we respond to that rapidly? So it's really making sure that we're maintaining those lines of communications with the CRT members to, to adjust as needed. Based on some of the common themes that were highlighted in our discussions through the CRT, um, the CRT also established five subtables. So some of the key pieces that, that, were, that came out were issues around family violence that were emerging as the, the pandemic progressed, um, seniors and the needs of seniors, a lot of isolation and, and the need to really have those focused discussions, volunteers, systemic discrimination and equity, as well as our municipal partners. So all of these subtables really provide dedicated forums to meet um, and have sort of dedicated conversations to discuss and problem solve. The CRT also has a dedicated mailbox, which is uh, monitored seven days a week by regional staff. And um, 
through the relationships with the community organizations, we've basically done we that the results of the initial survey, we identified the need to provide some emergency support for our community agencies to help them pivot rapidly to continue to provide services for the most vulnerable. So we went through and we got council's approval um, for a million dollar COVID-19 emergency community fund to support the community partners um, to respond to those emerging needs. And that has now transitioned to our our, um, community, our, our COVID-19 community fund as well. So there's more funding sort of flowing through as we're going along. We really created a low barrier application process for that funding and the team reviewed applications very vigorously and really rapidly to get the funds to the agencies within about three to seven days to make sure that frontline staff were able to really respond to, to the COVID-19 um, pandemic and any other issues, um, supporting sort of necessities of life for our vulnerable populations as well as staffing and operational costs to help them with pivoting their services. So in terms of impacts, what we have heard loud and clear is that really um, the, our initial goal to encourage that collaboration and sort of coordinated responses was definitely met. Um, we have heard a lot of positive feedback coming from our community agencies. And we recently conducted a follow-up survey with those community agencies to help kind of sort of gain a deeper understanding of what the impacts of COVID-19 have been on them. And one of the things that came out loud and clear in that survey was just how valuable this forum has been for them um, to just really receive that support from each other as well as from the region, high levels of engagement and collaboration as well. And they've really used that forum to learn from each other, share resources and information and partner with other agencies that they may not nat naturally have partnered with pre-COVID. So that definitely seeing sort of increase in partnerships happening there. Augustina is going to take over now. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so um, we thought that would show you um, this um, structure. So this is the pale poverty committee um, committee's um, governance structure. I'm sure some of you have seen um, a different iteration of it. Um, and so we have seven um, different tables in um, our st uh, governance structure. Um, and each table has a purpose statement. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that because we don't have time for that today. But you see our um, steering committee in the middle. Um, the steering committee has um, representation from all the other tables. Um, um, as well as the co-chair. So creating a pathway for information to get to all the other tables. And so this, um, everyone has an opportunity to know what's going on at, at the different tables and um, be able to contribute and know um, how they can contribute in different ways. Um, so, so just in recognition that we, ha we have other tables um, on the side. So we have um, tables like the Peel uh, Food Action Council, as well as the Peel Community Benefits Network um, that got born out of the uh, Peel Poverty Reduction Committee, as well as other tables um, in the community that we work with collaboratively. Uh, for this slide, I just wanted to talk briefly that um, during the COVID, we have some of our tables that continue to meet and collaborate. Um, as Alicia said, um, there's a lot of intersection um, and connection between the work that the CRT does as, and the, and the uh, Poverty Reduction Community. Uh, committee. So the um, Advocacy and Awareness Roundtable, the Lived Experience Roundtable, and the Systems Roundtable continue to be convened um, during this time. Um, as well as the steering committee. And so I'm just going to really talk briefly about how that interconnection between um, the PPRC as well as the CRT table. So um, the advocacy table, like I said, continued to meet um, just to, to continue to have conversation about emerging issues in the community that we're, that we're hearing about that impact vulnerable populations in Peel. Um, one um, example um, of response in connection to the CRT table is um, um, access to technology to help vulnerable populations to access um, internet connection. And so, the members from the CRT table, as well as the advocacy roundtable, are going to be collaborating to come up with um, some sort of advocacy um, type position um, to address this issue. 
Um, recently, our lived experience roundtable had an opportunity to get together in, um, in a consultation type um, situation where we asked them questions like, you know, so with the COVID, how has this impacted yourself or the community or your families? Um, and they, they gave some amazing feedback. Um, and just thinking about recovery as well, some of the things that they talked about was, um, you know, as, as, as is obvious, is housing, issues around housing, um, mental health, so isolation. Um, they talked about access to technology as well. And so all of that information is being themed currently and it is going to be shared with um, the CRT um, table. As Alicia mentioned as well, in terms of our systems roundtable, um, we have a subtable that deals with equity and uh, systemic dis uh, discrimination. But for our, so the, the Peel Poverty Reduction uh, Committee also does work around that. And so that work or that issue is going to be integrated into the Peel Poverty uh, Reduction Committee for, for us to either action that or to, um, to address that in the future. And so some of, those are some of the work that um, we've been doing to kind of um, to work with the CRT table that was created in Peel. I'm going to hand it over to Alicia again to talk about some of the things that we've learned through this uh, process. Thanks, Augustina. So, of course, naturally, we've really learned many lessons along the way that will sort of help to inform how we continue the work of poverty reduction in Peel as we move out of the into the recovery phase of the pandemic and ensuring that we're applying that COVID lens to a lot of the work that we're doing. So, for one, the CR CRT has really amplified the value of operating within a collective impact framework, which is really the guiding framework for our poverty reduction strategy. This collect collective impact framework has really helped to break down a lot of the barriers and allowed our partners to sort of put their heads together and generate innovative ideas to solve problems during the pandemic. A lot of partnerships have been formed and collaboration was a lot more effective uh, during this time as a result of that. The CRT really presented an opportunity to do things a bit differently and to prepare for a post-pandemic state that is much more coordinated, collaborative and responsive and well-informed. Of course, as Augustina mentioned, the issue of equity has been front and center throughout the pandemic and more so even recently with um, a lot of the issues that are sort of happening uh, in the states and across the world. So one of the goals of our poverty reduction strategy, um, which centers around equitable access to income, employment and essential supports and services for all of Peel's residents, our major takeaway from this entire situation is really that we need to be much more intentional. So even more intentional about applying a, both an equity as well as a systems lend to our poverty reduction work and also to the to, to the COVID-19 um, recovery phase of, of things. Through our CRT um, and the mailbox funding applications and the agency survey results, all of those ongoing connections and feedback loops with the community, we've seen existing issues and gaps that have always been there, but the COVID-19 has certainly uh, further highlighted um, some of those bar barriers and gaps. So it is critical that as we move towards recovery, we don't disregard these truths and really instead work on addressing the barriers and gaps in a more intentional way. And finally, through both of our work, both our work with the Appeal Poverty Reduction Committee and the CRT, we've consistently heard from our community partners how important it is to create opportunities for them to come together, share ideas and problem solve. So now that we've moved to this new governance structure that's no longer one single table, which is the way we had been operating for many years, it's really incumbent upon us to ensure that we are building in those opportunities for the full committee to meet as a group and continue to learn from each other and, and share ideas as we move forward. Thank you. And of course, we'd be happy to answer any questions and comments at the end of the, the webinar. Thanks, gals, very much. If I could encourage people, we've got one more presentation to go. So I'm going to encourage people while Kathy's talking to... Uh, Put any questions up you can either put it in the q a box at the bottom there or you can put them into the chat and kathy we're interested to hear from you in uh, saint john and uh we're uh, uh, interested to go from one perspective to quite a different one i suspect so over to you Okay, um, welcome everybody. Um, so um, I'm working with Living SJ and Living SJ is the poverty reduction strategy for our community. It's a group of, it's a network of influential leaders from business, government, uh, low-income neighborhoods, nonprofits, um, and uh, 
educational institutions really who have agreed to adopt a collective impact approach to break the cycle of generational poverty. And we decided to do that. We have a vision and an action plan that focuses on four pillars. Um, it's close the education achievement gap, it's transform low-income neighborhoods, it's neighborhood-based models of health and wellness, and it's, it's transition low-income adults into sustainable employment. Um, we also are the recipient of a, a $10 million social innovation fund from the provincial government. Uh, we're two and a half years into that now, and its purpose is with all of our experience and our learnings to demonstrate different ways to end generational poverty that uh, are worth the provincial government and other funders investing in the future. So to really gather the, the measurements um, and the evidence that proves that this is a wise investment going forward. Um, just a little, little bit about St. John, we're a community of 70,000. The greater St. John area is 125 and our region that we're responsible for is 140,000. So again, a small, a small community. Um, there were three impacts for us about COVID uh, from the COVID crisis. Number one is I think we really strengthened our services uh, to individuals um, and families and hopefully there are services and policies that will continue into the future. The second one is is that it really shed a light on the areas that uh, really need attention and also the recognition that there are some areas we still don't know the implications of. And then the third area is that it built relationships and it provided opportunities for us to highlight and celebrate uh, collective impact and its value to moving us forward to better meet the needs in our community. So provincially, I'm just going to talk about that for a minute. We are part of a, um, of a poverty reduction strategy, the Economic and Social Inclusion Corporation, um, where we're one of 12 community inclusion networks in the province. So as soon as the COVID crisis hit, uh, ESIC um, brought us all together and we began to meet weekly, uh, sorry, bi-weekly, twice a week, um, that's bi-weekly or not, twice a week, to really focus in on three areas that ESIC and the provincial government thought were important for our network to reach out to our own communities. So it was food security, it was transfer transformation, and it was to make sure that we knew all the essential services in our region, you know, from uh, food banks, uh, delivery programs, the pharmacies and who were delivering what, and could actually have that information distributed through our networks. Um, it was a good, a good opportunity to build relationships through it provincially, to understand what was happening in our province as a whole. Um, and then um, we have um, a lot of the transportation services then met on a weekly basis with us to really build more volunteer-based dial ride kinds of programs, but it really strengthened those uh, initiatives in rural communities and one of them being in, in our community. Then it was from there to how do we look at the rest of the gaps. So locally, um, as, as my other colleagues have said, it's our network that really helps us reach out, get the information and reach out to ensure that people have access um, to those areas and to a sense of what is going on that can be there to assist them. So we, we quickly pulled together um, a local food security network um, that you know, included the Horizon Health, it included United Way, our local social planning council, food banks, uh, an emergency food program to try to troubleshoot what were some of the issues and how do we better address it. One of the partners was an emergency food program that um, Tamarack through Natasha has profiled just recently. And then we've celebrated it through all the media because it is a collective impact approach. It was a group um, of neighborhood organizations that started because of the um, school breakfast and lunch programs closing down. And, you know, parents told us what an impact that had on their grocery bills and on being able to keep their kids fed all the time. Um, and so it started with a, um, an uh, outreach ministry with a church and the neighborhood organizations in a church location and then grew to include um, Horizon, the, the health network. Um, it, it moved locations to um, the Port St. John, offered a cruise ship terminal to pack groceries and to allow for delivery of, of the groceries into, into the one of the bays. Um, 
it, um, the Atlantic Compassion Fund with United Way kicked in money, but then through our, the rest of our network, we had business leaders and individuals who, in a very short period of time, raised $100,000 to support the efforts of this group. Um, and it was delivering to door to door for people and, and ended up delivering over three, reaching 3,000 individuals and families. Some of, the, some of the individuals were those who would not likely go to a food bank because it just wasn't part of their understanding of what was really available. Um, so it was, um, it, 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 there are very, it's now transitioning out and as part of our network, it's really taking the learnings and figuring out what do we do with that. So it's looking at, um, you know, the Boys and Girls Club offered uh, uh, transportation services. So how do we now work with our food banks to be able to A, transition people if they need it, and B, look at how do we provide transportation services to our food banks. So we've decided to try to focus on a neighborhood by neighborhood approach and build the asset, you know, bring the assets together, churches, food banks, neighborhood organizations, and others to really look at, are we meeting the needs of our community, both food security wise and others, and how do we better address that? So that's, that's what we're now working on in the future, for the future, and uh, we'll see how those learnings take us forward. One of the things that came out of that is the neighborhood organizations and our, uh, who are part of our Living SJ strategy though, it really helped to build our relationships and that now we're gonna meet on a monthly basis to look at, at issues that we've got um, in trying to meet the needs in our community. So I think that's very, we're very encouraged by that. Um, one of the things for our community is that we were able to, um, we, worked, we worked very closely with United Way and the Community Foundation to get money out the door through the Atlantic Compassion Fund, through the provincial government, and now the, the federal government to look at what does our, re our community really need and how do we do quick turnarounds. Very encouraging how funding processes were all about getting money out the door. Even with our homelessness uh, partners, um, they really were able to use their network to get the homeless money out the door quickly. Um, and that was, that was key. We also looked at, uh, uh, at, at information. Um, and so our um, Living SJ News, we started to focus on what were services that were, there are, that were starting up because of the COVID crisis and where could people go to in, get information. And then from there, we started to look at profiling how agencies were doing outreach to youth, to families, to single parents, so that people could get an understanding of what was happening and what were some of the issues and needs um, out there, but also to know that people weren't, weren't always left alone. Um, we also profiled issues and, uh, and different approaches. Uh, so one focused on housing. And one of the things with our shelters was the fact that they really were able to create new partnerships with the medical community that will be able to meet the needs of the homeless community and continue beyond the, beyond the crisis. There was a real estate company that raised money um, to cover its tenants so that um, they could help them with their rent and other issues. So examples like that we tried to portray to uh, get across collective impact and how it's really making a difference in the way issues are addressed in our community. Community. Um, one of the things with our, our housing partners is that they work provincially to it, COVID crisis indicated, it just pushed an urgency for them to look at the provincial housing strategy that was recently released to up the ante on the timeframes that we really need action in that area immediately. So really trying to push the advocacy area. There were lots of gaps. Um, our next issue of our, our news is focusing on domestic violence. And a lot of, of agencies are saying that we don't know the implications of that because there's been so much isolation. So trying to get ready and to get people to think about um, what are gonna be the impacts that we'll see in mental health <coughs> and in other ways. Um, another gap uh, is the digital divide. And I'll just wrap up with that one. And the digital divide, <coughs> excuse me, it's really the worry about the widening 
um, educational achievement gap with children, youth, and with adults. As one principal said to me today, it's the massive stay at home that we've had in the last number of, uh, of months. Um, we already were struggling with that gap. Um, and then we come to the digital divide if you don't have access to internet and you don't have access to laptops or computers. So um, a lot of partners are stepping up to the plate. Some of the funding sources that, that we just mentioned, United Way, um, the federal government, the business community. So we're trying to pull around working with the schools and also working with community partners to use technology in a different way. So one of our education and employment agencies found that that it was really had a skill building component to introduce them to the to the to to uh, narrowing the, the digital divide that people were um, introduced to doing e-transfers because they get incentives based on their goals that they achieve. So they had to get they had to get the money to them. So it, it made it forced them to look at e-transfers and doing stuff online and also the virtual programming with supports and coaching actually started to have to reach people who had anxiety issues or childcare issues or they were working part time. And so we're able to use that as a tool to better um, uh, reach individuals that we couldn't reach in the past. So it's helping us really offer to people um, the services and supports that they need. And at the same time, knowing that we still got a lot of work to do going forward. So I think I'll, I'll end it on that note. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm just looking at the, you, you've all raised so many interesting things, folks. And it's a pre, we're really appreciative of you doing that. Um, and I'm just looking at the, at the chat boxes. There's a bunch of specific questions, but here's a general one for you. It, it sounds as if in every case you worked collaboratively with your, your United Ways. Am I right? Right. Um, is there any, anybody want to add any particular comment about that, about what the challenges may have been about dealing with there were, I think one of the challenges in these, one of the difficult things in these kinds of circumstances is that money starts to flood in and it doesn't always flood into the right places, right? Or the right intermediaries or the right agencies. So can you just tell us a little bit about how you've navigated that as you've watched, granted, probably not enough money, but money is, and money is going to continue to start to flood in. Thoughts on that? Anybody want to start? Well, maybe I will just, I think what was important, um, we had actually a new executive director at the helm um, right. that had been their campaign coordinator before. And I think her attitude was, let's be nimble, let's pivot, let's meet the needs immediately. And I think that like, let's just do it attitude um, was really exactly what we needed. And she involved um, us and the community foundation for really looking at making a lot of decisions so that they were groups that already knew a lot of the partners out there. And, uh, and so that was also helpful too. Mm -hmm. What about Kirsten? Did you deal with the United Way as well in mission? Yeah, the United Way funding has been an incredible help here. I would say we spent a lot of time initially before we knew about the funding, uh, getting kind of developing, creating our, our ideas around volunteer programs and where we could be diverting funding. And then this, this kind of beautiful waterfall of <laughs> funding came in. So it meant we had to stop our plans. But I think it helped us here to really look at reframing, you know, from what could be considered, oh, we wasted all of our time doing this to okay, we came up with some really creative options, funding's here, let's take it, and then how do we move forward with the next need? So exactly that, adapting quickly. It, it feels like things are, are really evolving daily and just really learn, learning to go with the flow, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, Augustine and Alicia, talk to us about Peel. I mean, you're dealing with a region, so it's, you've got a bunch of diversity there mm -hmm. in terms of different governance structures, different priorities, a gazillion different agencies. Um, what, what would you say about this in terms of the real key challenges you folks had with trying to cobble this region-wide kind of, you know, initiative together. Go ahead. For us, um, so yes, United Way definitely is a major partner. They have been uh, very involved uh, in sort of just participating at the community response table and sharing any funding opportunities for our community partners. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, our uh, division, Community Partnerships within Human Services, we have a community investment program team. So we have dedicated staff that really kind of deal with all of the funding things. So a lot of it is really, as you said, as, as everyone said, sort of pivoting, really responding 
as rapidly as we could, um, trying to eliminate as much of the red tape as possible. So in terms of our funding, we had um, we really had very specific criteria, and uh, we pulled together a massive team uh, to review um, the, the applications as quickly as we could coming through. And of course, I mean, I have to definitely say our council was very, and our commissioner very supportive of trying to eliminate the red tape as much as we could to help get the funding out of the door. So council really approved the funding, even without us necessarily having all of the pieces in place. We had as much of it that we could to get at least get the approval to go ahead with it. And then at that point, we were working rapidly to kind of build the pieces. We were really building the plane as we flew it. So I think that helped a lot um, to kind of get it to where it needed to go and making sure that we were able to respond as rapidly as we could. So let's let's think about the future and where you're going to go. I'll start with you, Augustino. I think that, for instance, uh, I don't know how United Ways are going to raise money uh, because people aren't going to go into their offices for months now. And so most United Ways are raised in corporate givings based on people being at their desks giving. So what do you, that's just one, but what do you think the challenges are going forward? Let's start with you, Augustina. Thoughts about key challenge going forward? Mm, I think so. So one of the things that... Um... Alicia said um, around our funding model is, you know, being able, so like everyone else has said, is being able to pivot um, and hearing the voice. So being collaborative, you know, what are people, what are organizations looking for in terms of um, what's going to make it easy for them to carry out, to do these programs? Yeah. You know, um, are we looking at our criteria and, and making that easier for people to access this form in, in order to, to be able to, um, to implement programs? Um, for us at the region of I think one of the things that we did, we, we didn't do our regular funding model or, or criteria that we apply. We had to make sure that um, the, the criteria were less stringent um, I think one of the things that I've heard too um, in talking to community organizations is um, if we're not able to access our funding, we can't carry out this program. So what is what are governments doing? What are organization funders doing to make sure that it's easier for people to access funding in order to implement programs for vulnerable populations? Yeah, the question is whether we can streamline them even further uh, as we if we do go into a second wave or what next. Okay, so I think just last comment quickly, that means like 15 seconds, gals. To you, 15 seconds, Kathy, 15 seconds to you, Kirsten, and then we'll break. We'll go back to Christine. Go ahead, Kathy. Yes, I, I, think, um, I think one of the things going forward is really to continue to build the partnerships that we have actually uh, really counted on uh, at this time. I think there's, there's some very specific issues that, we all, that those partnerships need to focus on, um, such as transportation. So, uh, so really taking stock of where we need to have our priorities. Yeah, Kirsten? Yeah, the two key actions we're looking at are how do we realign with school needs beyond food, the school breakfast programs and things we know, how do we align with them beyond that around family support and mental health? And the second piece of that, I think we're really going to rethink how we engage and involve community in yeah. all of this. And Alicia, last word to you and then we'll go back to Christine. So I think definitely prioritization is a big piece. And even for us within the poverty reduction strategy, knowing that there's so many uh, emergent things that have sort of happened through through COVID is really trying to figure out how do we apply that COVID lens to our, our priorities, kind of figure out what the quick wins are, what, what's the low hanging fruit that we can sort of tackle between now and the end of the year, and then starting to think about how we, we adjust our priorities and capture some of that as we're moving forward. And the equity piece, I think, is, is really a big one. That piece is really going to be critical, not only for us as we look at our poverty reduction strategy, but also in terms of our funding to ensure ec an equity lens is applied to our funding applications going forward. Yeah, great. Thanks, gals. Terrific. Just terrific to listen to you and learn from you. Christine, back to you. Thanks, Mary. Thank uh, we're wrapping up here. Thanks to everyone for joining today. We will be sending out um, a recording of today's session, and we just wanted to flag two upcoming learning opportunities. We have a lot more um, offered on our website, but these two in particular I wanted to highlight, being ac accountable to our communities. What are we promising, and how are we working together? That's happening on June 30th. And then navigating change, three tools for moving from response to resilience. That's happening at the end of July. Both will be excellent learning opportunities, um, please check them out. And if you have any other questions or follow-ups from today, um, you can reach out to me at christine at tamarack.ca. We will be sending out the recording. And again, thank you so much for participating and for all your questions. And thanks to Mary for hosting the rich discussion and to all of our panelists. Mm -hmm.